Let's take a look at an empirical example of converter factor analysis. Our data set for the example comes from Mesquida and Lazzarini. This is a nice paper because they uh, present a correlation matrix of all the data on the indicator level. So we can use their table one shown here to calculate all the confronter factor analysis and structural regression models that the article presents. And we will also get for the most parts the exact same result. So uh, let's check how the confronter factor analysis is estimated in R and what the results look like. Specifying the factor analysis model requires a bit of work. I'll explain you uh, the details of this syntax a bit later. But generally uh, what we do first is that we specify the model. So we have to specify the indicators and uh, for every indicator we specify one factor in, in this particular case. And uh, then we estimate using covariance matrix and finally uh, we'll plot the results as a, as a path diagram. So that's the plotting command. And I have added some options to uh, make the plot look a bit nicer. So uh, let's take a look at the model specification in more detail. And uh, we have here, I have color coded this, blue is for factors and greens, green is for indicators. So we specify that we have uh, about eight factors and then we specify how each indicator loads on the factor. So we have a uh, factor horizontal uh, measured with three indicators. We have factor innovation measured with two indicators and then we have factor competition measured with a single indicator. So uh, we have three indicator factors, two indicator factors and single indicator factors which are the three scenarios that I explained in the video about model scales, uh, variable uh, factor scale setting and identification. So uh, what parameters do we need to estimate? We need to estimate our uh, factor loadings. We are going to be scaling each latent variable using the first indicator fixing technique. So we will estimate our uh, factor variances and factor covariances and indicator error variances. And uh, the model is identified for uh, using the following approach. We need to uh, set the scale of each variable. We set the scale easily each latent variable. We use the first indicator fixing. And uh, so we fix first indicator at one. That's the default setting. So we don't have to specify it anyhow here. And uh, then we need to consider uh, how the three, two and one indicator rules are applied. So we have these three indicator factors. They're always identified. We have two indicator factors. They are identified because they are embedded in a larger system of factors. So we are all we have these two indicator factors where we can use uh, information from other factors to identify those loadings. So we don't have to do anything special. And then for one indicator factors, we fix the error variances to be zero. So we say that these single indicators or single indicator factors are perfectly reliable. So we uh, say that the error variances are zero for indicators that are the sole indicators of their factors. So in, as a path diagram, uh, the result looks like that. So uh, we have factor variances here or factor, uh, factor covariances here, these curves. We have factor variances, uh, these curves that start from a factor and then come back to the factor. We have factor loadings, these arrows uh, from factors to the indicators. And then we have indicator error variances, these curved arrows here. Then uh, these dashed arrows are something that has been fixed. So that's constrained to be one and uh, that's constrained to be zero. So that's a single indicator factors uh, error variance is, con is constrained to be zero. So that's uh, what we have. And uh, there are funny things. So we can see here that we have some error variances that are negative. So this is a Haywood case. And I have another video explaining what a Haywood case is and why it occurs. So we have uh, negative variances. They are close to zero. So we can conclude that maybe these indicators are just highly reliable and uh, the error variance is actually close to zero. It's positive but close to zero. And uh, because of sampling error, we get small negative values. So these are small negative values 
we don't really care about that. We assume that they are highly reliable instead of this being a symptom of moral misspecification. Then uh, I say that these results mostly match what's reported in the paper. So there's a, a small mismatch in the factor loadings, but otherwise these factor loadings here match exactly what the article reports. In text form, the R outs outputs are a couple of things for us. So we have our uh, estimation information first, we have the decrease of freedom and we have chi-square that I'll explain uh, in the next video. Then we have the actual estimates and the estimates list we have our uh, estimate standard error, z-value and p-value and uh, this goes on for, for uh, it's a lot, fairly long printout. And then we have some warnings. So the warning here is that uh, we have the Haywood case so both of these warnings relate to that. Let's take a look at the estimation information part next. So this is, uh, and this is uh, the same kind of information is, uh, is given you by any structural ecosystem modeling software. So it's not exclusive to R. You will get this estimation information and then actual estimates. Let's take a look at the estimation information and uh, the decrease of freedom first. So the decrease of freedom is 147 and that's the same as in the reported article. So uh, where does that 147 come from? This is a, it's a good exercise to calculate the decrease of freedom by hand because then you will understand what was estimated. And there is a, a, a nice paper by Cortina and colleagues where they calculate these decrease of freedoms by from published articles and they check whether they actually are matches the reported decrease of freedom and they don't always match so that's an indication that there is something funny going on in the analysis. Let's do the decrease of freedom calculation now. So where does the 147 come from? We have first 231 unique elements of information. So we had um, the correlation matrix of all the indicators has 231 unique elements. So that's the uh, amount of information. Then we start to subtract things that we estimate. So we estimate 10 factor variances. So we have 10 factors. Each factor has an estimated variance. Then we estimate 45 factor covariances. So 10 variables have 45 unique correlations. Then we uh, subtract 11 factor loadings. So remember that when we always fix the first loading to be one to identify the factor. So we had um, 21 indicators. 10 are used for, for scaling the factor, then we estimate 11 loadings. Then we have 18 indicator error variances. We have 21 indicators, but three are single indicator factors. So we have to fix the error variance to be zero. And that gives 147. So that's the, the decrease of freedom. We can check that our analysis actually matches what was done in the paper by comparing the decrease of freedom and also comparing uh, the chi-square. The 147 degrees of freedom tells us that we have excess information that we could estimate 147 more parameters if we want to. After 147 parameters we have used all information and we couldn't estimate anything anymore. We can also use the excess information to check if the excess information matches the predictions from our model and that is the idea of, of model testing. So we can use uh, the redundant information to test the model. So we have more information that we need for model estimation. We can ask whether the additional information is consistent with our estimates. If it is, then we conclude that the model fits the data well. So the idea of, of model testing is that uh, we have the data correlation matrix here. So that's the first six indicators. Then we have the implied correlation matrix here. And then we have the residual correlation matrix here. Again, the estimation criterion was to make this residual correlation matrix uh, as close to all zeros as possible by adjusting the model parameters that produce the implied correlation matrix. And uh, then we, these are pretty close to zero. And if our model fits the data perfectly, it means that uh, it pre-produces the, the, uh, the, the data perfectly or residuals are zero. And we want to know if the model is correct for the population. So there are, the question that we ask now is whether uh, this model would have produced 
the population correlation matrix population correlation matrix if we had access to that actual population correlation matrix. In small samples the actual sample correlations are slightly off so they're not exactly in the population values and therefore the residuals are not exactly at zero. So we asked the question uh, are these differences from zero small enough that we can uh, attribute them to chance. So is it plausible to say that the model is correct but it doesn't reproduce the data exactly because of, of small sample fluctuations in the correlations. This question can these residual correlations be by chance only is what the chi-square statistic quantifies. So we have the chi-square statistic here it's a, a function of these residuals and uh, we have it doesn't really have an interpretation but it's distributed at chi, at, as chi-square with uh, 147 degrees of freedom and we can calculate the p-value for it. The p-value here is, is 0 0.25 so we say that if the residuals were all zeros in, in the population then getting this kind of result by chance only or greater we would ha get 25 percent of the time. So uh, we then cannot reject the null hypothesis. The null hypothesis is that these are by chance only. We cannot reject the null hypothesis therefore we say that the model fits the data well. This is the logic of the chi-square test in, in confrontary factor analysis and structural regression, mo and structural regression models. So uh, we want to say that these differences are small enough that we can attribute them to chance only and uh, we, we accept the null or actually we fail to reject the null. So th then we conclude that this evidence does not allow us to conclude that the model is, is misspecified. So we want to have a, a p-value here that is non-significant because it indicates that our model is a pl plausible representation of the data and we conclude that the model fits. Let's take a look at the estimation information again. So uh, estimation information gives us the, uh, the uh, p-value, the degrees of freedom and chi-square statistic, then we get the estimates and then we get these warnings. So every time when you get warnings uh, then uh, you need to actually uh, look at what the warnings mean. So here our R code actually tells us that we should uh, run inspect fit theta. So the theta matrix is uh, the, the error correlation or the residual uh, indicator error term co covariance matrix estimated from the data and uh, we should investigate it. So recall that we have the Haywood case, we have these three negative error variances and then when we do inspection of the theta matrix, so the theta matrix contains here there are estimated error term variances, so, so estimated indicator error term variances, all the covariances within the error terms are constrained to be zero because we didn't estimate them in this model and we can see here that uh, we have these three negative values here. So uh, what, what do we do with that? We conclude that these are so close to, uh, to zero that it's plausible that they're actually small positive numbers but this is just uh, uh, a small sampling fluctuation outcome.